Hey everybody, this is Pierre Quinn and you're listening to the Leading While Green podcast where my mission is to help you live, learn, and lead with confidence. I'm recording today from Bermuda and on episode number 54, you'll get a chance to listen in on my conversation with veteran conductor and author Roger Nirenberg. We talk about his passion for music and how he's using the orchestra to teach leaders across industries how to work together. So, listen up. So, I'm on vacation in Bermuda, and I gotta warn you, there's no telling what you'll hear in the background. You know, there are birds, there are scooters, people talking. You might hear a trash truck or a water truck. I, I don't know, but I'm on vacation. My family and I, a few days in Bermuda to soak up the sun, to enjoy the beach, to unplug and recharge for a bit before we head back and the kids start school and we get into sort of that fall routine. But I'm excited about today's conversation. I get a chance to sit with maestro Roger Nirenberg. Now, Roger Nirenberg is a veteran conductor and the creator of The Music Paradigm. Now, The Music Paradigm is a unique program that invites people to sit inside a professional symphony orchestra as the musicians and conductor solve problems together. Uh, from this experience, Roger has wrote, written a book entitled Maestro, and it's a surprising story about leading by listening. Now, it's a parable about a rising executive that's facing tough challenges, and the narrator befriends an orchestra conductor and is inspired to think about leadership and communication in an entirely new way. Really rich conversation with Roger Nirenberg. Now, before we jump into that conversation, I just want to encourage you to keep sharing the Leading Well Green podcast. Listenership is growing. Connections are growing. I'm watching the stats as looking at the podcast metrics, and that's all to you. That's thanks to you. Thank, thank you to those of you who took advantage of the free book. I was giving away a free copy of Leading While Green. Got a few copies left. If you send me your name, your address, uh, put put free book in the subject line to an email of an email and send it to Pierre at PierreCQuinn.com. That's Pierre at PierreCQuinn.com. And, and, and check out my blog, PierreCQuinn.com. Got some good stuff on there all the links to the podcast episodes, how you can work with me, especially if you're facing some leadership challenges, you need somebody to talk to your team or coach you. Check out my, my blog, PRCQuinn.com for all the information. You might even want me to come and speak to your group about, about leadership. So my blog is the place to connect with me. Now, here's our feature conversation with Roger Nuremberg. Excited today to be joining you for another episode of the Leading While Green podcast, where my mission is to help you live, learn, and lead with confidence. On this episode of the podcast, I get a chance to sit down with orchestral conductor, leadership consultant, author, and founder of the music paradigm, maestro Roger Nirenberg. Thanks for joining me today on the Leading While Green podcast. Delighted to be here with you, Pierre. So talk to us a little bit about your, where you developed your, your passion and your, your love for music. W when did it first start that you knew you were going to dedicate your life to music? I was about 10 or 11, and um, I just discovered it. it. It was almost as if it found me, but hmm. I... I found in, in listening to recordings of the Beethoven symphonies that there was this whole kind of other cosmic dimension that I had, I had never experienced in any other way. And it was enormous and incredibly powerful and beautiful. And I thought, whatever that is, I don't know what it is, but that's what I want my life to be about. Hmm. Now, is there, are there musicians in your family? Were you kind of the first one to venture into this area? Was it something that was passed down? Unlike most of my colleagues, I did not come from a musical family. Um, but those of us who don't, you know, who find it ourselves, have a special kind of passion and uh, no doubt in our mind about whether it's right for us. Hmm. So what, what instruments did you start with? What, what well, did you, the piano route or strings at, or? At that age, I, I was a trumpet player. Okay. Yeah. 
playing in the school band and the school orchestra. But almost as soon as I learned to write music, I, 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 as soon as I learned to read music, I wanted to write music. Hmm. And I wanted to create music like the, the music that I had discovered. So by the time I was 13, I was taking composition lessons. Hmm. And so my earliest training really was as a composer. And when I went to college, that's what I thought I wanted to do. But at the same time, I really, I adored conducting, and I did some of it while, while, while I was in high school. At what point in your mind did you begin to make that transition from, from you know, sitting in the chair, from learning the music, from writing the music, composing the music, to saying, I, I, I think I want to lead, I, w- I want to lead the music, and, and kind of wrapping your mind around this, this new skill set that you had to learn? When did that start for you? I think it was right at the beginning. I, I, it was always my fantasy. And then it became more than a fantasy when I was in high school. I was actually doing it mm-hmm. on a very small scale. And uh, when it came time for me to decide what career choice I wanted to make, I thought music automatically being a very difficult profession, so competitive and so little opportunity, I wanted to do something that, I knew that I really loved with a kind of a passion. And so I decided to pursue conducting. You're reading through your bio. You've, you've had the opportunity to guest conduct on some pretty notable stages uh, across the country and around the world. How, how did you feel when you had that? Well, what was the first kind of big deal experience for you that, that caused you to step back in awe and say, wow, I'm glad I made this choice. And then what, how do you feel or how have you felt subsequently over the years as those invitations to step on some of these major stages have come in? Well, I think conducting an orchestra is, is thrilling, hmm. especially if, if it's in, as you say, one of those great halls and one of the great orchestras, uh, and you're having a great musical experience. And um, you, uh, your ide- for me, my identity disappears. Hmm. You become you become part of the music. You become a musical force. And um, that's the experience that we, we look for. That's, that's why we do it, to, to, become, to become part of this incredibly beautiful thing. What was, what was going on in Jacksonville when you were, when you were conducting the Jacksonville Symphony? What, what was going on that made you think about the greater implications of your work in orchestral conducting for, for leadership development? Because that's, that's where you, you sort of gave birth to this idea of the music paradigm. What, what made you th- think that, man, this could work not just in the music space, but in the corporate, in the education space, in medicine, this, this idea of, of music can work for training leaders in different environments? Well, in the beginning, I re- never had any of those thoughts at all. <laughs> what I was interested in was uh, building audience for the kind of music that I love because okay. I knew that there were a lot of people whose support was vital for the symphony, but they really didn't have any relationship to the art form itself. Mm, mm. And what I challenged myself is, could I take people who were part of the population, Mm -hmm. but not part of the concert going public and not not part of the music going public, could I give them an experience of music which had something of what what drew me to it? Mm -hmm. So initially that was my, the first goal was to enlarge the audience for classical music. And uh, I wanted to target people who were important in our society but not necessarily um, influenced by music. Um, And so that was how I gravitated towards the workforce. Um, And I gave lots of talks when I was a music director. Mm -hmm. When I'd go to the the Rotary Club or the Mennonite Club and talk to these people, when I talked about music, they listened to me politely. And when I talked about the orchestra as an institution in their community, they got a little bit more interested. Mm-hmm. But when I talked about my job, that wasn't just polite interest. That was real interest. Mm. I saw that a lot of people were fascinated by the role of conductor. And so I, 
I wondered, would it be possible to, through that channel of fascination with my job, to deliver music to them? And uh, that's how I began to integrate um, what people do at work with how music can be relevant for that. And then when I literally was, I didn't know what I was looking for. I was just following, following my curiosity and my inspiration the same way as if I were composing a piece of music. Mm -hmm. And then I had invented the music paradigm. And when I started getting feedback from business people as to how powerful it was and how, what, what a great and inspiring experience was in terms of opening new vistas of leadership behavior to them, I only then began to discover what the potent potential might be. Give, give the listeners a snapshot. I know I'm talking because I've been doing some research on you and your program, and of course you created it, so you're intimately familiar with it. But if you're, if you're explaining it to someone for the first time or someone who calls you on the phone and has an interest in your program, how do you describe what the music paradigm is to them? Um, it generally is attached to some kind of meeting, okay. business meeting. And at a certain point, people come for this experience. They walk into a room, and the room is set up differently than anything they've ever seen. It's set up like an orchestra. Hmm. All the chairs are interspersed inside the orchestra. So lo and behold, they find themselves seated amongst the musicians. And the musicians are all dressed like they're going to do a concert. So it feels very strange for them and very foreign. And then first, you know, the first two or three minutes, we just play music without saying a word. And then after that, I begin to introduce them. I say, we're going to take a tour of this orchestra. And uh, what if this were like not just a musical ensemble, but a kind of like a an example of a state-of-the-art 21st century business and information organization with a distinct competitive advantage. And that competitive advantage really interests you. Hmm. And so you want to find out what is it and what are the skills and what are the behaviors that enable that with one thought in mind. What can you steal from the orchestra, transplant into your own life, and thereby bring greater success not only to yourself but to all those who work with you? And then I start to take them on a tour hmm. of various kinds of behaviors and capabilities that the orchestra has, always targeting the kinds of behaviors that this particular organization is very interested in acquiring. Because I customized every presentation for the specific organization and the specific success picture that they're trying to achieve mm -hmm. and also the challenges that they're trying to overcome mm -hmm. in order to achieve that success. And so we, you know, I display, I ask the musicians and it's all spontaneous. The musicians don't know what I'm going to ask them to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I ask them to adopt certain behaviors and certain demonstrations, but then the demonstrations get much more targeted and specific, and they now represent what that organization would like to achieve. Or they represent a particular challenge in behavior or uh, awareness that that organization faces. And little by little, these people who are sitting in the orchestra, they begin to feel like this is not a foreign place. This mm. feels more and more like us. And by listening to the orchestra in the various demonstrations that I do, sometimes uh, I create a distinction between a negative demonstration and then I fix it and make it positive. They begin to see what they could be and also what it is that they don't want to be. And mm -hmm. so it becomes very reflecting. Uh, it becomes a place for contemplation and reflection. And what's really special about it is that you can – you can challenge people to see themselves without them feeling defensive hmm. because it's only about music. Mm -hmm. So in the conductor's relationship to the orchestra, I display leadership. And sometimes I deliberately uh, model dysfunctional leadership behavior. And after I've done that, I'll, I'll 
hand the, go out and hand the microphone to some some musician in the orchestra and say, what's it like working with that leader? Hmm. And we have a dialogue about it. And what those people are hearing, a lot of them, they're hearing with, from the musicians when, in reflecting on what I just did. They're hearing what's being said about them behind their backs that nobody will tell them. Hmm. Normally, that's something that would make people feel very uptight. Mm -hmm. But in this circumstance, because nobody's being singled out, nobody's being attacked, and it's only about music, which doesn't have, seemingly doesn't have anything to do with them. But they begin to wonder, said, is that what I do? Hmm. do I that? And is that what my people think? Or when they see, they hear the orchestra playing incredibly well and with such energy and, and inspiration, and they begin to think, what would it be like if my people yeah. were that? So it, it, it starts as a tour of the orchestra, but it ends up being a tour of what their possibilities could be for themselves at work. I'm, I'm going to drop in the show notes to the show a, a clip from the PBS feature uh, on, the, on the music paradigm where you were working with uh, a hospital system. Now, I'm, I'm fascinated by this idea of specificity and, and customization. And I, I saw on your blog that you recently did a session, I believe, is with the the Dallas Mavericks. Yes. Now, now, how how was that? We're talking about now a a professional sports organization, a basketball team. How how how, how did they resonate with these principles of reflecting them uh, in the music that in in that experience? How how were you able to create that for them? Well, unfortunately, I didn't get to work with the the basketball players. Um, I work with the, the business organization. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it was a business organization which was very much in transition because the Dallas Mavericks have had some uh, very public uh, embarrassment mm -hmm. of uh, their culture and especially with the uh, issues of diversity mm -hmm. and issues of empowerment and gender bias and all those kinds of things. So mm -hmm. it was an organization that was very much trying to create a new culture and define the way that we're going to act towards each other, the way we're going to react, and the values that are going to govern that. And so I was able to, to display that in the orchestra in terms of, for example, what happens when everybody uh, is so intent on looking good and sounding good that they drown out everybody else. And they mm. is in fact to drown out other people and distinguish themselves. And then by contrast, I show what's it like if every color in the orchestra, and we use the color in a musical way of the, the color of the winds, the color of the, of the strings, you know, the brass, if all these colors can all be heard simultaneously and mm. nobody feels as though they have to shout in order to, in order to be heard. Um, and then how do you lead in order to inspire that to happen? Mm -hmm. So that was, that was the way I customized it for them. Now, in terms of receptivity to, to your program, and this is one of the things that came out in that clip uh, from the PBS feature on you, how, how have you seen people who walk into the session and maybe they're skeptics Maybe they're like, ah, I'm not quite sure if this is going to work. But then maybe a light clicks or something resonates with them and they, they become believers in the moment. How, how often does that happen in your experiences? Well, well look, you know, people in, in business meetings, mm -hmm. you know, everybody wants to be safe. <laughs> Nobody wants anything bad to happen to them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then they walk into a room where they don't know where safe is going to be. They don't mm -hmm. know what the rules are going to be. They don't know what their exposure is going to be. So everybody gets a little, a little tentative and a little questioning. Mm -hmm. They don't know whether it's going to be safe. And then there are the veteran people who feel like they've seen everything. And so they, you know, in two seconds, they figure out what it is and what it's going to be. And they're completely wrong. <laughs> and, and, and they, you know, sometimes the people are, are very resistant. They're hostile. 
Mm -hmm. they, they, they're being there because they're being forced to be there. You know? And I love that kind of audience because they have no idea how, how much they're going to be touched. And I think what wins them over is when they see how spontaneous it is and how unscripted and how real it actually is. It's not like we practice doing this stuff and now we're doing a demonstration. Mm -hmm. we're, we're doing stuff that's happening for the first time in real time. And the musicians are clearly so unscripted and they're not polished in the way they speak. And, um, and then, you know, the participants seated amongst the musicians are being called in to interact with the orchestra. Uh, so it's just so authentic that I think that's what wins people over. How has de developing this program and facilitating it over all these years, how has it changed you personally? How has it helped to grow you and shape you and develop you and even enhance your ability to lead? How, how has it impacted you? Oh, a lot. Uh, in so many dimensions. Uh, facilitating this way, in order to be a good facilitator, you really need to listen very well. And so uh, I realized that part of my, my skill set is the ability to ask probing questions and then to listen um, openly, extremely openly to what's being said, because that's what I build. I build the session on the remarks that other people make. Hmm. Not like I have all this content that I want to say, <laughs> I ask questions and then I, I work with what other people, the insights that other people have had, and then I build on them and develop them. So that requires a lot of listening and a lot of emotional intelligence. But then also, as I've come to understand the challenge that businesses have and how they need to respond quickly, they need to be agile, they need to um, uh, act uh, quickly and with transparency um, and they need to engage their their workforce uh, I've created a kind of leadership style as a conductor which uses those kinds of things as well so my style of, of leading musically has been very influenced by the kinds of uh, leadership behaviors that organizations want their leaders to understand Hmm. Talk to me a little bit about your, your book, Maestro, a surprising story about leading by listening. And I, I think you dovetailed in, into it a little bit, but what, what led you to say, okay, I think I need to, to concretize some of these thoughts and put it into a book form and share with, share this with the world. Well, during the very first year that I was doing this, uh, there was a, a very high executive at Bristol Myers Squibb who was part of the audience, and she said, have you written about this? And, um, and I said, no, I hadn't. Uh, and then uh, maybe a year or two later, there was a literary agent who called me up and he said he had seen me on television when he was on vacation in Istanbul. Mm -hmm. And uh, would I be interested in writing a book? And, and so I thought so. And then I... We, I struggled for about four years with the, that, the publisher that they found, and I couldn't write the book. I, just, I couldn't write it. It was everything that I wrote sounded so simplistic. But then I decided to write a completely different kind of book, hmm. and all it took about 10 years. Hmm. And, uh, but finally, I felt as though I had captured a lot of the ideas in the book. And it's a kind of fable, which is about a, uh, a leader, like the kind of person that you were talking about in the beginning. He's newly promoted to a leadership position, been a great leader, but at a low level. Now he goes to a high level, and he discovers that the things that made him successful at lower levels don't work at this level. <laughs> because, first of all, everybody on his team is more expert in what they do than he is. They've been around longer. They think they know. And they're very good at resisting, mm. and just don't. His leadership doesn't have any traction, and he realizes that he's in trouble, and he's looking for a new model. And through his daughter's music teacher, 
he gets introduced to this conductor and starts sitting in on his rehearsals. And the conductor tells him what his idea about leading the orchestra is, but it just so happens through the device of the book that everything that he's saying applies to that guy's particular issue that he had at the office that day. Hmm. And so uh, he starts over the course of the book to apply this new way of thinking, which at first he resists. He doesn't think it's, it's right, but he begins to see the wisdom of it and he transforms himself into a much more effective leader. Definitely going to drop the, the link to your book in the show notes and encourage people to pick up um, many copies uh, for, for their team. Now, just a couple more questions before, before I let you go. I know, I know your time. You're probably busier than I can imagine. Um, a couple of things. You're TEDx, TEDx speaker. You, you s- stood on stages not just as a conductor but as a presenter. You, you have in, in your community – a, a place of renown and regard. What is it in your life that keeps you keeps you humble and teachable and malleable, especially when you go into these environments where you do have the leverage and you do have the upper hand? What what, what keeps you t- to have, for lack of a better phrase, a, a teachable spirit or disposition um, coming from a place where you've had so much success? Well, I think that's a, a great question, and. Uh, being humble is is no problem for me because uh, I'm always trying to expand my musical skills of hearing better, um, having more facility to 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 play, and uh, you know the body learns slowly, hmm. and you as you study an instrument you learn kind of like an animal learns. Hmm. So you're, you're sort of you know highfalutin human intelligence. And uh, intellect, let's call it intellect, mm-hmm. doesn't get you anywhere. You you need to have a much more integrated kind of intelligence, which includes the body and body awareness. And you discover that if you get if you get critical, you you just slow yourself down. So you have to stay open and curious all the time. Um, and so that's a spirit that. I bring to everything that I do because I see how valuable it is when when you you stay open and you don't judge, uh, but you continue to experiment and and watch and see what happens. Hmm. And so I think part of the effectiveness of my presentations is that I have that attitude, and so people don't feel as though they're being judged. And they get very curious. At first, they get curious about the orchestra. Then they get curious about their own jobs Mm. and their behavior. Um, So I think it's a wonderful question. I I just don't have any trouble with falling into arrogance or Mm. anything like that. It's the furthest thing from what I struggle with. I struggle with mastering myself. Mm. Here's, here's the last question I, I want to throw your way, Maestro. My, my youngest, my oldest daughter, uh, a couple of years ago, she picked up strings. She started violin at her elementary school. And my youngest daughter is starting with a vocal performance coach. And I've seen how those, experience, those musical experiences for them at their young age is you know, helping them with, with confidence, helping them with listening, attention to detail, forming their, their character and their personality. So I, in my own house, I see the impact of it. But but for you, from your vantage point, why do we still need the arts? Why is it such an important part of the fabric of our culture and our life to keep this thing alive? And you talked about bringing in a new a new category of listeners to to your style of music. Why why is this so so important for our culture and for our society? I just think if anybody considers what kind of an advantage it would be if you could master your own impatience. Hmm. If you could focus your concentration and stay with something and not need to, to get distracted, not need to somehow stimulate yourself with something, but rather probe in and how much you could accomplish, how well you could communicate, how well you could listen what kinds of skills you could acquire. Um, And all those things are the stuff of 
of music. Hmm. Uh, so that I think, I think society is desperately in need of the skills that, that I highlight in my sessions, and especially the skills that young musicians study. Um, they become much more powerful uh, as, uh, let's put it this way, the, the kinds of lives that they lead will be much richer, with much richer and deeper relationships, hmm. and, and they'll be able to achieve a much greater success, no matter what it is that they devote themselves to. My guest today on the Leading Wild Green podcast has been Maestro Roger Nirenberg, the, the creator of the music paradigm. He's a leadership co- consultant. He's an author. He's an orchestral conductor. He's an influencer, and, and he's a pretty good guy and excellent at conversation. Thank you, sir, for, for joining me today. It's been a pleasure having this conversation with you. Thank you so much. It was a great conversation with Maestro Roger Nirenberg of the music paradigm. Now I'm going to put all of his links in the show notes, how you can get in contact with him, find out more about his program, YouTube links. He was featured on PBS. I mean, his program has allowed him to work with some of the top organizations in the world. And you want to know about Roger and his work. All right. Just want to encourage you again to leave a five star review and some comments on iTunes to share this on your social media. Drop an email to a friend or a fellow leader and let them know about this podcast and how they can use it to help them live, learn and lead with confidence. And until next time, take care and God bless.